there is, I suppose, a small but prestigious minority of elite scientists who maintain that uh, the materialistic uh, viewpoint that the mind somehow emerges from the brain doesn't really hold up. Yes, there have always been outstanding uh, neurologists such as Sir John Eccles, who's a British neurologist. Nobel laureate. Indeed, yes, mm -hmm. and Wilder Penfield, too. both of whom believed that the brain, in some sense, was an instrument which was played upon by a non-physical mind. And, of course, this view is very ancient. I'm sure it goes back to Paleolithic times when people believed in the survival of the spirits of their forebears. And one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this viewpoint, which is these days called the dualistic viewpoint, is because it, it's one of the possible theoretical mm -hmm. explanations for the phenomena of parapsychology. Uh -huh. They're typically mainstream scientists and, and positivistic, behavioristic philosophers, they get a little upset, a little indignant, even if you use the phrase the mind or the soul. They, they claim that you're, you're making a, uh, a categorical error, that you're, you're describing a problem process as if it were a thing. Yes, that's true. The sort of position that you're outlining classically would be that taken by the British philosopher Gilbert Ryle. who wrote the mm -hmm. uh, concept of mind, which he sought to prove was really, a mind talk was a way of talking about behavioral dispositions. And in fact, uh, later philosophers have seen that this clearly cannot be the case, and there are very powerful technical problems in reducing statements about people's behavior to statements about intentions or beliefs or consciousness. In other words, wh what you're saying is, is that to view the mind as an entity, as a thing in and of itself, is now considered acceptable uh, in mainstream philosophy. I'm not saying it's ac acceptable. I'm saying that the attempt to reduce mind to just being the brain seems to have failed in some way, and that the philosophers are aware of that, but the people who have bright hopes for artificial intelligence in the computer world still expect it to, that reduction of consciousness to being some form of brain process to occur. And, of course, we mustn't forget that if we are talking about the existence of a non-physical mind, that's importing something very strange and very different into the universe from the regular matter which the physicists have so far told us does exist. But something very akin to what spiritual religious traditions have been saying all along. Well, what interests me is the fact that the kind of view of man as consisting of at least two separable elements, that is, a body including the brain, and a mind which can separate from it at death, seems to have been a consistently held view by very widely uh, divergent groups in different parts of the world, different forms of culture, and at different times and places. And if we look at parapsychological phenomena, if we look at the phenomena of the out-of-body experience, the phenomenon of the apparent survival of people uh, of, uh, through death. The near-death experience. The near-death mm -hmm. experience. The deathbed experience itself, where people allegedly <coughs> see their departed relatives coming in to welcome them into the Netherlands. And also, many other forms of psychic uh, happening are explicable on the basis that there does exist a separate mind from the body. The real problem is to produce a theory which is modern, 
which describes this in terms which make sense to us as 20th century psychologists rather than in the 17th century terms of René Descartes who was the sort of paradigmatic dualist uh, theoretician or the old forms of anthropologically interesting but obviously scientifically invalid view of the spiritualists, the occultists and the uh, different sort of primitive groups who believe this. One might think that one of the reasons that many mainstream scientists today reject the evidence of parapsychology is because it does challenge their materialistic view of the brain-mind system. That's certainly true. And unfortunately, as parapsychologists, we have a set of phenomena which seem to be very, very uh, naughty from a Monty Python point of view in the sense that they won't lie down, they won't go away, and they won't behave themselves and become normal physical residents of the universe. For example, in precognition, people seem to be able to pick up information about the future. This simply shouldn't be possible. Equally, uh, ESP, telepathy between people, for instance, doesn't fall off with distance like radio waves would. And in addition to that, we have my people at the laboratory affecting instrumentation in ways that we simply don't understand and which really don't look as if they're normal physical processes. And all of this suggests that perhaps what we're dealing with is a realm of phenomena where somehow we're transcending the normal limits of space and time. And this was a very mm -hmm. uh, uh, clear position held by many parapsychologists throughout the history of the subject. I think the crux of the argument must boil down to what we mean by the normal limits of space and time. After all, physics, uh, quantum physics, the fundamental philosophical foundations of, of physics are in great uproar right now. Where there's big disputes as, as to whether the equations of quantum physics can be taken to literally mean that there are multiple dimensions of space or that time could run in both directions. That's true. We're in a very interesting period because it looks as if the whole issue of what interpretation should be given to the mathematics of quantum physics is virtually up for grabs. And uh, perhaps a form of dualism may come in through that particular approach. Mm -hmm. I know that the theoretician Evan Harris Walker has said that essentially what makes a quantum reaction finally get to some determinate endpoint is a human consciousness observing it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's really uh, all that need be said about that area, but this is certainly mm -hmm. one position which, which is being advocated. Well, Evan Harris Walker, we might mention for our viewers, is a, a physicist working with the U.S. Uh, Army Ballistics Research Center mm -hmm. in Aberdeen, Maryland. Uh, interestingly enough, that was a center very uh, crucial in the development of the computer, and the same point uh, was made 30 years earlier by John von Neumann, the great mathematician in, uh, who invented uh, the von Neumann machine, which is the basic architecture of all computers. And uh, he suggested exactly that, that the collapse of the quantum wave function or the basic observation in quantum physics really occurs when someone, when some conscious entity becomes aware of that. That's true, because when you look at the mathematical descriptions of the quantum process, it cannot give you an explanation for why the collapse should occur according to this viewpoint. And uh, the consciousness movement in California is very fond of citing mm -hmm. these uh, arguments as being definitely true. Well, Julian, neither you nor I are physicists, but I think we have to try and explain what we mean by collapse of the quantum wave function. It's just, it's so esoteric. Okay. What we're talking about <coughs> is that when a quantum reaction occurs, the, say, two particles collide. There are, there's various different possibilities which could actually occur as a result of the outcome, as an outcome of that particular encounter. And what the quantum terminology of the mathematics says is that the system actually is in every one of those possible states. Could but be hundreds or millions. That's right, could be thousands, mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily uh, well uh, d defined apart from each other. And what then happens is that when you observe the system, you find the electron or the particle in only one particular place. And what's said to happen is that that realm of possibilities which was inherent in that situation becomes collapsed from being diffused out, almost like some kind of spatial cloud, into one particular event. And hence we talk of the collapse of the state vector. And there's a sense, then, in which the very physical world, as we observe it, all of this nuts and bolts and uh, knock on wood, etc., et is actually created by our act of observing it. 
That is a very interesting viewpoint because working in psychokinesis, one is very aware of the way that events are being created apparently by people's conscious or unconscious intention. And the idea is around in parapsychology that perhaps large aspects of the world are created by people and that maybe what we're living in is a mind-dominated universe where the human race has come to a consensus as to what things should be like and the world therefore operates along those lines and if as a group we totally changed our minds then the planet may operate in a different way and this kind of viewpoint was was first really clearly summed up by the German philosopher Kant who said that it's only human beings who impose the notion of space and time on what is really a sort of smeared out existence without things being separate from each other. Very much as the English philosopher and physicist David Bohm talks about in his notion of the implicate order in which the universe exists most of the time and what we see are just eruptions out of this sort of void. In, in other words, we have a physical world, or we observe a world, world around us to be physical. We have the laws of physics, but in effect, all of our laws of physics, all of our observations are generated uh, by our brains, or by our nervous systems, or perhaps by our minds. So that's true, and when you say by our minds, one of the things that interests me in the parapsychological theories of the existence of minds separate from bodies is that parapsychologists have wanted to produce a picture of the mind which is more detailed, and especially more detailed in talking about the relationship between the mind and the brain than anybody ever has done so before. And there were two uh, British uh, theoreticians Thal Less, who was a professor at Cambridge University, and B.P. Weisner, who was also at Cambridge, who produced a theory of dualism which said that the mind in its relationship to its brain uses psychokinesis, the ability to affect matter, to initiate the voluntary action of the body, and uses ESP to scan the brain. And in this case, the brain becomes this very sophisticated sensory system for scanning its environment, pre-processing information, and then displaying it to the mind entity, which reads the information off the surface of the cortex by ESP. And this is an important theory because, in some final sense, it gives a place for ESP and psychokinesis, why it gives a reason why they should be in the world. Because otherwise, they just appear to be rather strange and bizarre, a rather meaningless kind of peripheral features of the world. It also suggests, then, that any individual who is able to use their brain to function in the world is, is automatically psychic, at least internally, within themselves. That's right. And the problem of using psychic ability becomes the problem of taking the attention of the mind entity away from the brain and going directly into the physical world, as in clairvoyance, or maybe to somebody else's brain or perhaps somebody else's mind, as in telepathy. And then, if you are able to take your mind power, so to speak, and use it directly on the physical world, you then have psychokinesis. Mm -hmm. It raises an interesting question, or, or addresses an interesting question, and, and that is when I, out of an act of pure will, say decide to lift my hand, how did I do that? Well, the neurophysiologists such as Eccles and uh, Penfield would say that what happened was that your mind manipulated your brain in such a way as to initiate that series of voluntary actions. Mm -hmm. Well, how is that view regarded in science? Well, the view is not taken seriously at all because it's not yet proven. And mm -hmm. the difficult thing about dualist theories is it's very difficult to prove that they're true. One of, one of the things I've been interested in doing is to see if we could deduce provable, empirical, experimentally testable consequences from dualist yeah. theories of mind.